my son that we keep talking about uh, was just a, <laughs> like a little three-year-old. I was putting him to bed and he said, um, uh, you know, God told me I had to come down and be a human. And I said, really? Well, what did you say? I told God I didn't want to come. Why not? Well, because it's not very nice down here, Mom. And it's just so nice over there. And I didn't want to come. And I said, well, what did God say? God said I had to. So I asked him to show me my mother. And he showed me a picture of you, like out of a photo album. And then I looked at your picture and I said, oh, she looks mean and I don't want to be her son. <laughs> I'm keeping it together. Boo -boo. I am not, <laughs> you know. Oh, and what did God say to that? He said, I had to come. And you know, when God tells you to do something, you have to do it. So I got inside your body. And then when I was born, I looked at your face and I said, oh, you're beautiful. And I'm glad you're my mom. But he was born dead cord around his neck. They had to resuscitate him. So I think that conversation happened where he could have gone back, but he decided to stay. podcast. The opinions expressed on Broderland's podcast are those of the guest speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of the host or Broderland's podcast. Margo, welcome to Broderland's podcast. What an honor to have you on. Well, I feel really honored myself that you would invite me. I think you have an amazing story, like kind of like what uh, Gandhi said, our life is our message and we all have a message and you have a beautiful message on your life journey. So I appreciate oh, you coming you. on. They taught me in the 12 step community when the heart speaks, the heart listens. And I know you speak the language of the heart. So I'm excited to have you. Before we get started, you can share a little bit about your upbringing. I think you have a fascinating upbringing, not the normal one <laughs> in, in some yeah. sense. <laughs> normal for me, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, yeah. uh, I've always heard spirits. I hear this very powerful, deep, I see it as, I hear it as male, I think, because it sounds so deep voice. Um, I've had visions into the future. I get impressions, but I've had it my whole life. So I don't know any different. As a child, my earliest memory would be when I was like three and four years old. Um, but at the time, I didn't know what it was. And I didn't know that it was any different than how other people saw and heard things. And I was so lucky, Boo Boo, that I had parents who thought this was normal. Mm -hmm. And my mom would really, my mom in particular, my dad was a space scientist, engineer. And uh, my mom was just so good about, like, I used to see um, rooms would be filled with people. I thought they were people. I'd even say hello to them out loud. <laughs> and uh, my mom would, before bed, she would, uh, now, are there any, are there any uh, spirits in here? Did you look under your bed? Let's look in your cupboard behind your curtain. And uh, she was really good about, of course, I'd get into my bed, go, going, but they all come when you're all sleeping in the night. I can see their faces. So sometimes I'd be plain terrified. But I'd say the, the most powerful um, one that shaped my life happened when I was four years old. And I was playing in my living room. Well, I had come up from, we had basements. So I came up from the basement to put my little doll, Michael, to bed. And as I was pulling up his blanket, I heard, you are to be a teacher. Just simple like that. Mm. And I said, okay. And in my childhood uh, conceptualization of life, I guess, I thought that meant like a school teacher. 
I became a school teacher. I became a high school English teacher. And I had opportunities to do other things, probably sexier things like, you know, uh, I was asked to go into hotel management. They would put me all over the world in different hotels and I'd be running them. But no, I said, I can't do that because I promised that voice that I would uh, be a teacher when I was four years old. And, uh, you know, I, I promised that. And um, sometimes it felt like a burden, like I'd like to be free to just go off and do other things. But mostly it was a real comfort. And a lot, you know, I've been on other podcasts and people ask, why do you think that voice comes in so strongly for you, Marco? Why do you hear it? And I said, because I listen. Mm -hmm. And if it tells me to be a teacher, I will be a teacher. I will devote my whole life to that. I'm not teaching high school anymore because I went off and got my PhD in Oxford looking at how would we integrate spirituality into public education. I think our school systems wow. are too mind dominant. And we'll get into what that means because I have a way of talking about mind dominance. But I think it's too mind dominant and our spirit and soul kids can't find a place in there. And they can feel as if they're not intelligent, mm. but they have a different intelligence and they access information and they get uh, their insights in a different way. And as a high school English teacher, I, it was the perfect place to get them to, you know, do the more philosophical parts of life and to do visionary writing. So I really loved my career. But as a child, you know, I used to see things and I, I didn't know I was seeing into the future. And the big one was uh, when I was in my living room. I, my living room seems to be a popular place now, come to think of it, for, <laughs> for spirits. But anyway, it was in my living room yet again. And I heard that voice again and it said, um, uh, die, breast cancer, 36 Oh, you'll miss your mom. And even right now, as I tell that story, I can see my mom. She was setting the table. So I thought at eight years old that I was going to die of breast cancer when I was 36. And then my dad came in the door and he said, what are you doing crying? And I said, I'm going to die of breast cancer. What if 36 the voice <laughs> told me? And he said, you're too little to think about things like that. Well, I did think about things like that. And I happen to know many, many of your <laughs> viewers had the same kind of thing growing up, right? Yeah. Um, and my mom ended up passing away of breast cancer when I was 36. Mm. So I didn't always know as a child how to put all the pieces together. Or even I now know that I ask questions. So when I get something like that, I'll say, tell me what you mean. Show me in a different way. Is, have I understood that correctly? And I do that now, but I didn't know as a little child to do that. But again, I was so lucky to have parents who never, ever made me feel odd or, and they, and now my family kind of relies on it. <laughs> well, that's amazing. Um, how do you know the difference between like the voice in the head ego versus the voice that's coming to you? through spirit? Is there a difference? Well, um, that's a good question because um, in all the visions that I've gotten, the word ego doesn't, doesn't uh, ever be brought up to me. Um, and anytime somebody says, oh, is that from the ego? I actually have to Google, what is ego? Hmm. And uh, so I... I, I just know the sound of the voice and it's a very deep voice, but I have other voices that come in. They're high pitched ones. Mm -hmm. Like I remember I had a client, for example, and I gave her her life cycle chart to do. And then the, the a, boy, a different voice came in and it said, tell her she needs to remember her kindergarten <laughs> self. Just like a little high, you know, cause it's high vibration. Mm -hmm. Tell her, tell her she needs to remember her kindergarten self. 
And they said, oh, okay, do you have anything else for her? And I always write my messages <laughs> down on yellow pad of paper before they come. So I put it on, I sit at a harvest table that looks like this back here, but it's a table. So I put it over here, a yellow pad of paper. And then she arrived and I said, how did your life cycle chart go? And she said, I got stuck at kindergarten. I said, did you tell me? And I start writing on a different piece of paper what her kindergarten experience. And it was really, really good because she came from an abusive household. And it was the first time she ever had experienced a kind adult having friends, freedom, safety. And um, I was writing right down to what play centers did you like and everything. And I said, would you like to know what the spirit said to me, what you need to work on? And so I went and got my pad of paper and I showed it to her. It said, remember your kindergarten self. And very often, boo-boo, you know, you go back to, you know, you were born to have an exceptional life, a beautiful, beautiful life. And sometimes, like, sometimes you can just be born into a family and everything gets derailed. Mm -hmm. And so it's much harder to just start pulling back so that you can carry on and be everything that you were always intended to be. Yeah, thank you. You know, one of your, I heard you speak on another podcast and you were sharing about your son seeing the Buddha or some of what the Buddha, and it reminded me of Zen Master Thich Nhat Khan. He passed away a few years ago, but um, he wrote The Living Buddha, The Living Christ. And I, I told Marianne Williamson this. I don't know if he realized he became the Buddha, the living Christ. He was such mm -hmm. a beautiful person and treasure for humanity. Um, but he talks about a story when he was seven, to eight years old, and he's seen a picture of the Buddha in a magazine and the Buddha was on the grass, like I may be meditating and with a smile. And from that point, he wanted to be the Buddha. He wanted to be just like the Buddha. And um, his, he told his parents he wanted to be a Buddhist monk and they didn't want him to become a Buddhist monk. And at 16, he becomes a, um, a Buddhist monk, but um, he became, he literally became the Buddha in, in his lifetime. So um, uh, Martin Luther King, um, nominate him for the Nobel Prize, um, Peace Prize. Thomas Merton was a good friend of his. Um, so he was just a really uh, beautiful human being. So I thought I'd share that story with you. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You had a couple near death experiences. Well, I call them near death because living in this spirit, I don't feel human particularly like I have to, like I find it quite challenging down here to do some like even to get like, uh, you know, those soap dispensers where you have to twist it so that you can get the pump bottle challenge, mm -hmm. <laughs> total challenge. Like I just don't understand how all that works, but I know how a lot of other things work uh, in the spirit realm, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I've always had a uh, connection with spirit. So uh, I'm going to tell you the two experiences. I call them near death experiences. But the thing about the human spirit, like we have a spirit dimension, which we'll get into today. And your spirit will came in from absolute unconditional love. And it will go back into unconditional love. Hmm. But it's not like your spirit suddenly appears when you pass over to the other side. It's there right now. That's what I work on. If your spirit hmm. is already here in your body, looking outside your eyes, are you taking care of it? So let me tell you my two experiences. The first one, I was 18 years old and uh, I got really, really sick. And I, I think I had a real like high level strep throat and I was so feverish and I was just at university the first few weeks and they put me in an infirmary, which was in the basement of my university dorm. And they put me in there and there was a hospital bed and they assigned a, a student nurse to come and look after me. Well, she came on uh, Thursday and she said, oh, you know, I've been wanting to, because we would just, you know, she would just sit there and talk to me most of the time. And uh, she said, I, this guy, I've just wanted to go out with him so badly. And he's asked me out for Friday night, <laughs> but I can't go because I have to look after you. <laughs> well, <laughs> I said, well, go on your date, go on your date. Um, I'll be fine. And she said, okay, I'm going to phone you at nine then. And uh, because I had a phone by my bed for emergency. And uh, so anyway, she went and then I had a 
dream, was it? I don't know. But my spirit came out of my body and it was heading to the most beautiful orange light. So magnificent. I felt free. And then I thought, oh, I've got to go and say goodbye to my roommate on the fourth floor. And I, so I, I was on the ceiling and I was coming out of the basement on the ceiling and I got to the front lobby and I saw all the girls in my dorm room, dorm, dormitory, and they were all dressed in ball gowns waiting for taxis. And I saw them and I did this somersault in the air. And uh, I, this one girl saw me, she looked up at me like, what am I seeing right now? And I said, you've just seen your first ghost, mm -hmm. but I have to go now. And I flew up to go into the room where my roommate was and uh, she wasn't there. And then I came back into my body and my nurse came flying in the door after nine o'clock. She said, I phoned you and phoned you and phoned you. Mm -hmm. And you didn't pick up. I thought you were dead. And I said, I think I was dead because I came out and this is what I saw. And she said, oh, yeah, they were going over to the military college. They all had dates lined up for the military college and they were going there. And I said, I saw one girl and she's and I always tried to find her, but I couldn't ever find her. But my roommate is still my friend to this day. And uh, my daughter's getting married this weekend and she is coming to the wedding. So I can't wait to see her. And yeah, so awesome. that was my first one. My second, so was it an out of body? That story served a purpose later in life. Mm -hmm. And it served a purpose for one of my students whose friend was murdered in the night. And my student got a message on her phone that had no caller ID on it at the exact time that her friend was murdered. And she couldn't get to her phone on time. And she said, oh, just no caller ID. She was racked with guilt that had she picked up the phone, she could have saved her friend. Mm -hmm. So I told her the story. And I said, you know, the first person I wanted to see was my best friend. I think she, mm -hmm. was, just, she was just letting you know to say goodbye. I would mm -hmm. take it as an honor. And I love that story because the, that student came back to me uh, when she was in her thirties and we went for coffee and she, and she burst into tears and she said, you saved my life that day wow. because I really wanted to go home, like mm. off to the other side. And, uh, you saved my life and she's, she's, uh, finishing off her PhD now. So I'm, I'm thrilled for her. So that's the first one. The second one uh, was I was doing a ceremony and it was a fasting ceremony, no food, no water and uh, no drugs, no chemicals involved. And some viewers write to me saying, well, you should take some chemicals. No, I'm just, I just want to do the way I'm doing things. Like I'll fast. I like, I like meditating, that sort of thing. Right. I like to question the universe, ask questions. Uh, anyway, so I was in this ceremony and on day three, no food or water. And you're in the hot sun for four days. And suddenly I just dropped to the ground. And then my spirit came out and it went to the most beautiful, unconditional love I've ever seen. I had to open my eyes really, really big. And then my mouth really big. Like I was like this. <laughs> going up like this. And then my mom came down because she had passed like two years earlier. My mom came down and then she said, you can't come up any further, but I could see other spirits going up, whizzing past me. Wow. And they kind of look gray, like as if it were raining backwards, wow. you know? <laughs> and uh, so my mom said, you can't come any further. You have to go back down. And then I got, I came back into my body and I was on the ground, but that's what my mom's face looked like when she passed. Her eyes were really big and her mouth was wide open. I thought, oh, now I know what she was looking at. The most beautiful unconditional love because I was with her when she passed. Um, but that story, like, 
you know, I didn't have a whole bunch of beings come down and tell me all kinds of things because I have that every day. I could do that right after this interview. <laughs> I can sit and have them. Yeah. Did I miss anything with Boo Boo? Did you, was there something else I was supposed to tell his audience, you know, so I, I can do that whenever I want. Um, and I think a lot of your guests can too, if you know what you're looking for. But anyway, but what does the significance of the story, I think that's the most important part, which is that unconditional love. There's a part of us, our spirit part came from unconditional love. It's going to go back into unconditional love. Why do some people make it miserable down here, Boo Boo? <laughs> what is with that? Can't we just accept people and love them and get on with our passions in life? So once I understood and I felt the immense feeling of this white light, unconditional love, um, I thought I'm going to create that wherever I go, in my home, in my classroom, with all my friendships, wherever I go, I'm going to try and stay in that vibrational energy of unconditional love. Doesn't mean being a doormat, but to stay in that vibration. Then I found out, here I'm talking too much, boo-boo, but I found out a year ago, because I, I, I ended up in a little bit of a communication fiasco with somebody. And uh, that voice came in and said, well, Marco, don't solve it from down there. Come up here into the white light. You know how to get here. You've been here before. Come on up here. Come and sit with me. And so I took my spirit up and I was sitting up there. And tell me everything. And you know, one of the things I, I, I really believe now that deep voice is God. And God is available to all of us. And it is that white light energy. And I think God, my version of God is your best friend, mentor, therapist, hmm. best friend, guide. And so I went up there. And I said, here's, here's my problem. I created a fiasco. And then I heard, I'll solve that for you. So I really recommend to viewers now, do a meditation. Take yourself up into that beautiful, bright white light. Our spirit remembers that light. So if you don't know what that is, you know, and I'm trying to explain it so generally here, but tilt your face up to the light. Your spirit remembers that light. Tilt your mm -hmm. face up. Bring your consciousness up and have a conversation and just say, here's what, here's what I have on today. I'm going to have an interview with Boo Boo today. Can you bring the words? Can you come in with us? Can you come here today and, and keep us on track? And if you have any messages for us, let it come through today for all of our audience, because we're all searching, seeking for that enormous love and that connection with you. And it, it's hard to come back out of that space. So I have, a, I have a meeting with God, that voice, every morning with my coffee. Yeah. And I tilt my face up and I have a conversation about what's coming in today. What do, what do I have? Can you come with me? Guide me every step of the way. And then I have a debrief every night before bed. Mm -hmm. And then periodically during the day, if I don't know what to do, I tilt my face up to the light. And I'll say Bring me a refresh. Reset me now. Reset me. Makes a huge difference. I love that. Did you have a life review? You hear about life reviews when people have near-death experiences? Yes, I've heard about life reviews, and I've been shown some very, very interesting things about them, actually. I don't know if I've talked about them anywhere else, to be honest, hmm. because they're so fresh. Um, and uh, I have not been through my life review because I haven't gone that far over. But my mom came back and told me what Judgment Day is. And I was making Thanksgiving dinner, and I had made quite a mess in my kitchen trying to get all my pies and my cranberry sauce and all that. And she was in the kitchen, standing there, her spirit was. And um, so my, uh, my son came up, the one who loves Buddha, 
And he said, mom, when's dinner going to be? And I said, you know, at the time I had lost my mom's ring that I wore because I had taken it off to make dinner. And I said, I'm looking for grandma's ring. I've lost it. Can't find it anywhere. And he said, well, probably grandma's here wants to talk to you. And I said, yeah, she is. She's standing right there in the corner. Well, she wants to talk to you and then she'll give you her ring back when she's finished. She just needs your attention. Oh, okay. So away he goes back down to the basement. And uh, what my mom was there for was she said, I found out what judgment day is. What happens is you go over to the other side. You go into the unconditional love. Then you have to come back down and get inside all the people that were significant to you in your life. And you wear them around. You wear their consciousness around. You stimulate memories, stories, uh, feelings in them so that you can figure out what kind of human being you were. So she said, I'm here today to, I want you to be completely honest with me because I'm up in unconditional love now. So I'm not going to get mad, not going to, I just need to know because I'll put all my puzzle pieces together of what kind of human being I was, mother, friend, sister, wife, all of that. Once I get an idea, the whole thing of what kind of human being I was in this lifetime, then I get to go to my next level. I don't know what that next level, I haven't been shown the next level though, boo boo. So maybe one day I'll know what that next level is. So that's one way of thinking. She said, you don't, God doesn't judge you. You judge yourself. And as far as reincarnation, which I'm into now, um, because I had one of mine come through and she said, I need you to listen to me. Oh, okay. Um, So we are an extension of all the people and all the types of human beings we were. So we Mm -hmm. can extend them and hopefully be a new and improved version of what they were. So that's one thing. But here's the new piece. Um, When my son that we keep talking about uh, was just (laughs) like a little three-year-old, I was putting him to bed and he said, um, uh, you know, God told me I had to come down and be a human. And I said, really? Well, what did you say? I told God I didn't want to come. Why not? Well, because it's not very nice down here, Mom. And it's just so nice over there. And I didn't want to come. And I said, well, what did God say? God said I had to. So I asked him to show me my mother. And he showed me a picture of you, like out of a photo album. And then I looked at your picture and I said, oh, she looks mean and I don't want to be her son. (laughs) I'm keeping it together, boo-boo. I am not, you know. Oh, and what did God say to that? He said, I had to come. And you know, when God tells you to do something, you have to do it. So I got inside your body. And then when I was born, I looked at your face and I said, oh, you're beautiful. And I'm glad you're my mom. But he was born dead, cord around his neck. They had to resuscitate him. So I think that conversation happened where he could have gone back but he decided to stay. But here's the life review idea. He was shown a photograph. And when you listen to people who are having their life reviews, they're often shown in photographs of your life or videos. So I've now figured out the power of our photographs as part of our life review and the importance and significance. So I'm working on that concept right now. And I'm working with with people who, I, I don't like to do it to the broad because I never know who's listening, but there it's a very powerful thing, um, our pictures and honoring them and how you can create, you can get yourself back on your blueprint. And what I, if anybody's suffering right now, Go and find a picture of yourself when you were really, really happy. 
happy and healthy. And if that picture is you at two years old or five years old or 20 years old, whenever it was, find that happy, happy picture when you're so healthy and go and put it somewhere in your living room. Your spirit will see that and then try and bring your body into that vibration of being healthy and happy again. Just try it. I love that. Thank you. I, I always um, wonder if the, you know, the ancient comedic or Egyptian story of weighing the heart is what they're trying to describe with the life review that you just described. Hmm. Um, so, um, yeah, they would weigh the heart and see if it's, it weighs like a feather, hmm. um, you know, if it, but um, yeah, I, I, th I think that's amazing. I, I believe in reincarnation myself. And one of the reasons I like to talk about reincarnation, because maybe if we try to question and start to understand reincarnation a little bit more, maybe uh, all this racism and ignorance, discrimination for the spacesuits will go away and bring us back into more of a oneness state um, and, you know, more living more with our inner connection because we're all interconnected, I believe. And um, I don't know. I, I just love that. And when I was a kid, I was had some memories um, of some little glimpses of past lives. But one that popped up is um, that I, I forgot about when you were talking. I was a teenager. Right. And uh, I remember seeing a scene of a Native American that had an arrow. He was he was dead on a horse and he had an arrow um, between his back. they coming out of his back to outside of his chest area. And he was completely like he was dead on a horse by cliffs and i wonder if that was i i feel like that was a scene of a past life for me um, because i i remember as a, 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 a i wanted to get that tattooed on me <laughs> um it, it came strong that image it kept coming to me but uh yeah just just interesting <laughs> it is interesting i like you know you can have these flashes of memories that don't belong in this life hmm. and uh, i have a similar one to yours and uh I always had this sensation, unless I was sitting with my back to the wall, of something chopping the back of my head, and my head would go like that. So this indigenous man here in Canada said to me, we'll go to a quiet place and ask to be shown the story of that, of why you feel that. Mm. So ask questions. So I said, okay. So I lit a candle and I was in the dark and I said, show me what's, what's going on. And I saw myself, I was way back in the early days of Canada on the east side of Canada. I live on the west side now, but, and I was around the campfire and my fam, I was indigenous and the family, my family was all killed. And there was a man on a horse and he had this, Thing like this, like a rock, or I don't know what it was. And I remember going down, crouching down by the fire. And then I put my head down like this. And I said, I was wondering, is he going to take me or use that rock? And uh, then I felt the clump, you know, and I thought, yeah. oh, but I remember thinking, I will not cry and I will not beg. I will not cry. I will, and I was just perfectly calm. And calmness that. for me is a real important thing. To stay calm when everything is all chaotic. Isn't that amazing to be able to do that uh, when you don't react and everything's crazy out here and you're interconnected and you're just at peace and calmness as everything's going all crazy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just to experience that's pretty awesome. That doesn't happen to me all the time, but a lot of times it does mm -hmm. for the most part. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes it'll get the best of me. And now I have tools to use to get rid of that energy. So, exactly. That's the important thing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you, you said something, you say something profound that's much different than a lot of people when they talk about spirit versus soul. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between the soul and the spirit? I didn't, I was also in that camp where I thought they were saying the same thing because people use them interchangeably, right? And uh, uh, when I was doing my, can I tell them about my five dimensions? Okay. Please, please do. Um, 
when I was doing my master's degree, we had a homework assignment and I, and it was, I took one course just for myself. It wasn't even part of my thesis, but it was something I was interested in. It was called philosophy of mind. And our first homework assignment was how are the body, mind, spirit related? Well, I thought, oh, well, that's right up my street. Yay. <laughs> I'm going to go home. I clear my space. I do have rituals that get me into the high vibration zone. One of them is I have to have very shiny floors. The high level spirits like shiny, you know, and sparkly and shiny. So I got everything all real cleaned and everything. I lit my candle, I got my yellow pad of paper out. And I said to, because I was going to connect with the voice. And I said, how are the body, mind, spirit related? Now, boo boo, I wasn't expecting what I, I got. I thought it was going to be something like a one sentence. This being, which was always a deep voice, but now it's actually in my living room. It was massive. Like it should have gone through the roof of my living, again, in my living room, very profound place, my living room. Anyway, um, maybe that's why we call it a living room, I guess. It gives us all the profound experiences of life in there. Um, so it was huge, massive. And it said, um, you have five dimensions of self. You have a body. I'm going to just show my pie chart here. You have a body, a mind, a spirit, a soul. And this, it said it used oneness, but I put one because I, I couldn't get oneness. This is my little handwriting on here. I couldn't get oneness to go all the <laughs> way across here. So sorry, everybody. I did it this way. Um, and uh, so I could understand the concept of a body. I could understand the mind, which is our logical, rational self that makes lists to do and does our technology and does our taxes and all those kinds of things. Um, our spirit is the spirit I've been talking about that came from unconditional love. We'll go back into unconditional love. And one of my most powerful questions is, have you created the life your spirit came here to live? Hmm. Um then you have, and your spirit is like the real you. Because some people are in mind-dominant jobs that are crushing their spirit. Or in a relationship that's crushing their spirit. Okay, so that's your spirit dimension. Your soul dimension is your purpose in life. Why were you put here? And especially at this time in history. Like we've been put here on earth at a real profound awakening period. And we're part of that. Mm -hmm. And oneness is God, but it's our, it's our connection to God. It is, um, it is our sense of connection and belonging. I put it white because I wanted it to be that white light that I went into when I had my near death. Mm -hmm. Um, so you have five dimensions. And then the spirit said, um, you're born dominant in one of them and you grow the others over time. Body dominant. Really, their spirit came in and loved the body experience. Hair, makeup, nails, fashion, shopping, design, decorating, cars, uh, those kind of real sweaty sports like hockey and football, rugby. Um mind dominant. They love the logical, rational systems. They like to be the boss. They like to create the systems. Um, so we have school systems that are kind of mind dominant organizations. Spirit dominant, which I would put myself as a spirit dominant person. A spirit dominant, their spirit came in and it's it's a little more challenging to being human. It's a very complicated thing to live down here and be a human. You have to have a whole bunch of skill sets. Um, and I, as a struggled along, like trying to navigate my way here on earth. And uh, so I'm a spirit dominant and I value unconditional love and peacefulness. I need a peaceful life. That's why I stay calm. I need that in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And spirit dominant people, when they get stressed, they want to retreat. They want to hide away from this noisy world out here. And, and they can also feel like a stranger here on earth, like an alien. Their, their, their spirits looking out on a world that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to them. Why do we do it this way? Why is there war? Why is there, why is there fighting in the streets? Why is there homelessness? Why do some people go to drugs or alcohol to just, you know, block that sensation of having to be human? Why can't we, why can't we, I'm trying to get people to spirit dominance to step up to leadership. So instead of retiring away, can't you gain more skills and become leaders? You understand peacefulness and unconditional love. How, how can we become leaders? Soul dominance, they have a purpose in life. And usually they know it early in life. I found mine out at four. They know their purpose and that's all they want to do. They don't want to do any other. Like I, I'm pointing over here because I have a whole bank of windows over here and it faces up to my city center, all the skyscrapers and everything. And uh, I live in an oil and gas town. And so I think about that, you know, as I'm looking over there, I couldn't work in a mind dominant organization, boo boo. Mm -hmm. I have to have more creativity. So I couldn't work over in the oil and gas industry because it's not my spirit. It's not my, it's not my sole purpose or my, what my spirit wants to do. And oneness dominant are people who really have a profound sense of connection and belonging. And that's their one number one driver. And I realized when this came to me that I had low oneness because I was spirit dominant and a stranger here on earth. And I used to think it's so hard down here. I just want to go home. How long do I have to stay here? How long do I have to, you know, breathe, eat, do all these things that humans have to do. So I used to have those conversations with that voice. And when I first, when I wrote the first book, this one, I called it the exquisiteness of being human because I said, you know what I need to do? I need to make earth my home. Mm -hmm. I need to find ways to love it here. And so I did. And my connection with God grew stronger and stronger and stronger. Now I need to live like till I'm 150. <laughs> but here's the thing. And I think this goes back to something what you were saying earlier is that um, when I was first given this vision from that massive figure in my living room, it actually didn't say you have a body, you have a mind, you have a spirit. It said you have oneness. You have a soul. You have a spirit, you have a mind, you have a body. When I wrote this book, I wrote it oneness first. I didn't know much about oneness. I think my chapter is a page and a half long because I was so depressed. I was so low in my oneness. And after COVID, people's oneness dimension really got low because they were quite lonely. Like loneliness is a sign your oneness dimension is low. So anyway, I put oneness first. But when I did my second book, my editor said, Marco, put body first. People can understand they have a body. If you start with oneness, they're not going to get past the first chapter. So in here I say, but remember everybody, oneness comes first. Remember, how would our world be different, better, more enjoyable if everybody put oneness first, connection and belonging? Thank you. You brought up... Um these beans, oh, with, they love shiny. Well, can you speak on that one more time? I, I totally forgot what you said. The reason why I'm saying that is because I just did a, um, a, um, an episode with, I don't know if you're familiar with Freddie Silva. Mm -hmm. And Freddie Silva talks, we talked about ancient, the ancient, um, the ancient world, but you would hear about the shining ones in different cultures all over the world. Mm -hmm. They would talk about the shining ones. So these other beans. So that's what um, made me think about that when you said that. I thought that was interesting. Yes, like it's they the, the spirits that are high vibration 
they don't they don't like mess and dirt and you know clutter they like so you're better off to have a simple home where all your mirror like you know i have a glass table over there i've got a glass table over there glass over there um and if I'm going out, I try and have something sparkly on, you know, and uh, so they they like that real clean, sparkly. And I used to have some of my high school students who um, had they were getting their how do I say this? Um, they'd let their physical part deteriorate. Hmm. And so they were kind of attracting the negative. So it's so important to just make sure your body is clean. If you want to attract the high vibration ones that speak to you about kindness and love and, you know, I don't know if that's, so I, I, I keep, you know, I'm, maybe I'm obsessive about, uh, you know, I like, I have floors that are shiny, tabletop shiny, and I just have one of those yellow cloths. I can just run around quick, making sure. But I live in a small place. I live in a condo, so it's easy to maintain. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Well, you talked about feeling alienated because that's been my experience as well. Mm -hmm. Why does that happen when you have this, like an awakening? You feel alienated, but you still feel connected to everyone. But you're alienated at the same time. At least that was my experience. It's been my experience. Well, your spirit can, you know, it remembers, it knows the whole possibility of unconditional love and peacefulness. And it's looking out on a world that's, um, you know, where somebody's out uh, beeping their horn because they want somebody to get across the road quicker or, you know, like they're just people, they're getting angry and um, and sometimes even like in school systems, you know, you can get so rigid in the rules and all of this that you don't have enough flexibility to let the spirit shine. There are just so many things that are going on and you just go, we need a reordering. And we all know that. That's why we're watching all these channels, right? Like that's what you're in that space where, um, you know, you're creating opportunities for your viewers to get really in touch with their spirit. And, um, and we need that safe places to build a community like ours. I get so many emails from people talking about how that I'm brave talking about my stories. And I'm waiting for the day, I hope I get to see it, but waiting for the day when that's not considered brave, it's normal. Like I grew up like that, that this is a normal part of life to be like that. Um, and But it is a part of me that, um, I will never, uh, shy away from. So even when I was in Oxford doing my PhD, well, now why did you want to become a teacher? Because a voice came to me when I was four years old and said, you ought to be a teacher. <laughs> I, I, I just have to, you know, I just have to be always so honest. But what I did as I said, I'm going to really uh, work on my mind dimension and create that sense of logic. Mm. And I think the way, and I had a really good editor, I think, in here that <laughs> kept, kept probing me. You know, Margo, you know, like you need to be able to not alienate mind-dominant people who don't understand the spirit. Bring them into the conversation. They can understand they have a body. They can understand they have a mind. Bring them over here to understand you have a spirit. Is your spirit happy? Is your, does your spirit love the life you've created? Does your spirit love the job? Like I had high school kids that uh, I could see them just hiding away under their hoodies. And I have to say to them, like, uh, where do you go when you get sick of us? Well, they had a vibrant spiritual world that they were living in, that their body looked like they were, a, you know, driverless car parked in the driveway. But their spirit was living this vibrant life.
So again, I'd get out my yellow pad of paper and I'd say, what is that life? Show me what it is. And um, I'd write it all down and I said, well, and it'd be something really quite profound and really, really great and doable. And I said, well, my number one job is your teacher. And as a parent to my own kids and that, my number one job is to help you create the life your spirit came here to live. Maybe we need to change your timetable. You need to take different courses so that you can get yourself that there. So why do people feel alienated? I think sometimes if you hide your real spiritual self, that's why you're doing such a profound job here with your podcast and growing it and getting people involved. And, you know, I hope that that helps if that answers your question. It helps a lot. Thank you. Um, you could probably relate to Neil Donald Walsh. I just had him on not too long ago and he talks about, you know, he had yellow writing paper and, um, you know, when he talks about yeah. having conversations with God and he starts writing, mm -hmm. I'm sure you, you can relate to him. Mm -hmm. very well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I was reading his, uh, I guess his latest book and I thought, Oh, he uses yellow pad of paper too. I wonder <laughs> yeah. what the significance of that is. Interesting. <laughs> Yeah, one, one thing I'm grateful for in the 12 step community is they taught me how to share my stories and, and, and you know, speak from my heart, kind of like what we talked about in the very beginning. And uh, I hear that in you, and I, I appreciate that. And, but I get to a point in the 12 step community where it was unhealthy for me to say I'm an alcoholic and mm -hmm. certain things I had to learn. Um, what's your take on that? Is that unhealthy to continue to tell yourself that over and over? And because I had to rewrite, change the story. I don't want to get stuck in the old stories. And I just felt. You know, that inner voice, that intuition for me told me that's not healthy for me anymore. Let go of that custom or that that behavior pattern that's agreed upon with the collective. Yes. Now, I have different takes on things than other people do. Um, so I, I this is and I'm always in an evolution of understanding. You know, I'm, I'm always questioning. I I hope I never know it all. Right. Where am I in my level of understanding of this? I would agree with you. And we are always, like you've heard of, some people talk about our blueprint. And we came down, we chose our blueprint, and we chose maybe to be an alcoholic or a drug addict. And I'm just not, I'm not convinced that's true. Mm. Uh, and I feel that some some beautiful spirits can be born into a life and there are challenges there and they're not supported in their challenges. And so they can go into drugs and alcohol to kind of, well, because our indigenous people here say that uh, alcohol is called spirit. Like when you go to the liquor store and it says wine and spirits, and it says, because alcohol can make you feel like you're in spirit. Calm, like my near-death experience. Light, worry-free, I'm up here. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that once you start connecting with your spirit and saying, I don't need the alcohol or the drugs or whatever else it is, uh, I am this person now with a full spirit. So I don't like to pull people's spirits back to a past, an identity that is, they've outgrown that identity, if that yes. makes sense. But also, remember I was telling you about the pictures? Mm -hmm. I'm going to dare to tell this story. Um, <laughs> I, I had uh, somebody's son was uh, a drug addict and she was in my group. And we, I, ha I run Ask the Universe groups and I teach people how to connect with that voice up there. Um, anyway, I give them activities to do spiritual exercises. And uh, the exercise, when I figured out about the power of our photographs, I their homework was to take a picture of somebody that you love, 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 but who's struggling. Go and find the happiest, healthiest picture. And put it, we have prayer tables in our, where we have our, our photographs of all our favorite people over there. Put it on your prayer table. So this woman put a picture of her son who was 
10 years into drugs, still living with her. Uh, but he hadn't worked. Um, he, he, he just was on drugs. He was like basically comatose most of the day. So she put a picture of him when he was about seven or eight years old in his Superman costume, jumping off the couch. And she said, I need to bring him back to when he thought he was a Superman. And he's so excited. So she put it out there. And this had been going on for 10 years. Now, I can't say this is going to work for everybody, but it seems to be working for everybody in my groups. Um, It's worth a try. She put it on her prayer table. And uh, two days later, he came up out of the basement and said, I'm ready to get off of this if you'll help me. Mm -hmm. And so it was hard. It's not to say that everything, it's, it's hard. It is a lot of work. You have to stay so committed to, your new, to the identity of getting back on your blueprint of the person you were always meant to be. That's what I mean. I don't think everybody chose everything. I think you can fall off your blueprint. And once you're back on your blueprint. So anyway... That was about, I think we're two and a half to three years ago this happened. Well, within about eight to 10 months, he um, signed up to do his master's degree overseas. He's now finished that. He's now started his first year of his PhD. He ran the, the local marathon. Like that's how fit he is now. And he's found the love of his life and they're moving in together. So he's back on his blueprint. And I'm really like his mom, who is a PhD in healthcare. She must have spent hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to get him well. And, and I don't know if this works for everybody, but she said, I know it was that picture. It put him back on his blueprint. So I think Mm -hmm. if we look at where are you, are you on your blueprint? You can get back on. And I think you're on your blueprint now. Thank you. Of that healthy, vibrant person. Be that. I appreciate that. And that's what I try to provide here is a safe place for people to share their their different takes, their different perceptions and, and beliefs and, and you know um, views on things. Because we live in a world, if you don't think like me or act like me, you're against me. And um People that, that come on the show, I, I don't agree with everything they say, but I give a safe place to, you know, to um, learn from everybody, you know, mm-hmm. um, take what agrees with me and leave the rest. And uh, I definitely agree with what you're saying. And uh, that's how I look at it as well. And I, I agree with uh, Gabor Mate, where he mm-hmm. talks about how addiction is not it's not a disease, but it's an attempt to escape human suffering, this exactly. disconnection. And that's what that's what happened to me in my life. I I, I felt disconnected. Something happened, and that's what the word trauma means. Wound. And mm-hmm. Peter Levine talks about it's a disconnection of, of self, and, mm-hmm. and, and I don't feel whole. And even Carl Jung, who helped a guy named Roland Hazard back in the day, talked about his craving for alcohol was equivalent on a low level of thirst, a spiritual thirst of being for wholeness. And and he says it's equivalent to the medieval language uh union with god which is what religion really is the root word is means to reconnect or rebind just like yoga means to unite or uh you know uh, in union with spirit and recovery means to um to get back and, and yes. that's been my but that doesn't mean go back to that and believe that's you again mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so i had to follow my truth and, and just because it's a collective custom doesn't mean i have to do that well, yes. So then, you. you know, I talk in here about when when you're stressed, like what does a body dominant person do when mm-hmm. they're stressed? What does a mind dominant person do when they're stressed and spirit dominant people when they're mm-hmm. stressed? They just need a break from being human. So you may find it comes out in different ways, like you just need to sleep a lot. Because you just it's just too hard out here. And, you know, life is getting so much more complicated to live here now. And if we and so maybe we need some more simpler times. Maybe people are getting kind of uh, saturated with how many things we have to remember and do and 
all of these things. But spirit dominant people, they could sleep all day long, go to alcohol, go to drugs, um, you know, just sort of not want to buy into this whole mind dominant culture. And I find what I have to do is I have to recognize when my spirit dominance is sabotaging me. And I, I had a bit of an overwhelming day yesterday, Boo Boo. And uh, I was looking at my uh, schedule for travel and all the places I had to be. Then I had to try and figure out, oh, I'm going to have to run that now out of a hotel room and such and such. And I've got to make that plane trip and I've got to get over. Well, my spirit loves to lie on the couch and vision. It doesn't want to be in all these airports and trying to figure out which ho- I've got to get in there. So I've got to run that meetup group by seven. No, it doesn't like doing that. It wants to go la 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 la. <laughs> so I thought, okay, there's your spirit dominance, Margo. It's coming in here to sabotage all the progress yeah. you're making. Make mm-hmm. yourself a list, type it all out, take a breath, make sure it's manageable. You can do this. Yeah, thank you. I got to get your book. I would love to get you back and really read your book and study it and get you back and ask you some questions on your book because um, I just haven't had a chance to grab your book yet. And it sounds like it's a must read for myself. Um, you know, we, I used to be an alcoholic and I had my coping skills was to uh, when I had to deal with stress and everyday pressures of life and, and painful events that I didn't know how to express, talk about and, and deal with drinking made sense to me. It's an attempt to escape human suffering, right? Mm -hmm. But now I had to learn new types of coping skills to deal with everyday life, which is what I like to call spirituality. And you don't even have to call it that, you know, it depends, you know, but applying principles that can bring me back to my whole, keep me whole and and, um, help transcend these these situations, you know, get past Mm -hmm. them. And, uh, how do you do you feel there's an importance for that? And I love what you talked about being a school teacher. And um, I feel like uh, religions kind of screwed that up a little bit with the becoming collective egos. Um, no, this is how you do it. This is how you do it. But they all share the same principles. It's just the belief systems that create division. And um, one thing I loved about Paramahansa Yogananda, he was talking about having life life schools and ha- dealing with all of this. Um, what's your take on all that? Being a school uh, teacher, I, I live quite a probably I do have rituals for myself and I encourage all the people in my meetups and webinars to create the ones that work for them. Mm. So I operate always on this. So I've already been for my morning run. Uh, so I take care of the I, I wake up. I ha, Here's my ritual every day. I wake up. I get the coffee going. I light a candle. And I go into my briefing with God first thing Mm. in the morning. And I say, this is what I have going on today. I need some help, some guidance. Here are some concerns I have, some worries. Um, Now, yesterday, when I got myself in a bit of overwhelm, I said, Marco, you know better than that. Tilt your face back up into the white light. Bring the sense of calm back down. Everything on your list is doable. You will do this. Yes, of course. So I do that. I So I do this. Then I go for a, I have, to, I like to exercise because I like the body to be healthy. I eat very um, high vibration foods. Like I love, you know, fish and greens and all of that. But that's not to say that I don't like a delicious mm. ice cream cone on a Friday night. That's for sure. Um. So I do this and then, you know, make sure, get the hair done and get ready for the day. I found some lipstick that stays on all day. So I don't have to, once that's done, first thing. So that's my ritual for the body. Then I go over to what I have to work on, which is my mind. I get all my mind list done. And then I always make sure I've created a life now that my spirit really loves living. It really loves it. It loved like, look what I get to do, boo-boo. I'm talking to you right now. What's not to love yeah. about that? I have such a great life. I love talking to super cool people all over the world. Um, I have to live on my soul's purpose. So I, 
I make sure that my life and my work is really in alignment with my spirit and my soul purpose. If it's not alignment with that, then I'm not doing it. Because a lot of soul work, there are other soul dominant people that will take care of that. I don't need to do everything. I just do my piece. I stay in my lane. My lane is this. <laughs> I stay in my lane and I do this. And I try and help people as much as I possibly can. And then over here, connection, you see my uh, oneness can get low pretty easily because I like spending time by myself. So I have to say, Margot, you need to go and invest in some oneness. But my daughter's wedding's this weekend, so there'll be a lot of connection and belonging there. And, I, and that's my whole wedding speech, is how, <laughs> how important this very intimate community of people, makes me cry, boo-boo, have come together to support this couple moving forward, you know? So I'm writing my speech and... My daughter, she's mind dominant. She said, it's not going to be all spiritually, is it? <laughs> I, <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, well, um, it's going to be. <laughs> uh, we used to battle, she and I, because she is so mind dominant and I'm so spirit dominant. And she said, she said to me one time, Mom, do you know that expression, the meek shall inherit the earth? I said, yes, I have heard of that. And she said, isn't that stupid? Like, <laughs> <laughs> why would we want weak people running anything? Then it got me thinking, boo-boo. You know what I think that means today? Because everything is an evolution. Even our reincarnations and everything, we're in an mm. evolution of our past selves. And we're getting stronger and more aware and everything, um, hopefully. And uh, I thought it's spirit-dominant people. Meek. Spirit-dominant people aren't out bragging or uh, using people or... Uh, being aggressive to get what they want. That's why I'm I'm doing, I'm, I run a webinar series. My next one starts in October, my next series. Um, but it's spirit, uh, spirit dominant leadership. How do you do it? How do you mm. do it and get these uh, messages out there? So that's what I think meek shall inherit the earth means now. Right? We're humble, uh -huh. yeah. but we have deep, deep understandings. Hmm. I love it. I love that. Thanks for sharing that. Um, do you have like a website you can give me and I can, uh, uh, I, I can do. It's uh, www dot drmargomckinnon.com. So it's D R. And then M A R G O T M C K I N N O N dot com. And you can look up my series, and I call them webinars, but it's really me teaching because I like to have my people, people who are invested in this. I like to see your face. I want to make sure you're really getting it. I want to see, we want conversations. We want to come back the next, like I do them every other, so they're every two weeks. We get a new, exercise you go away and you practice these exercises, and then come back and say how it worked and then you get your next lesson and then another homework exercise um so i really love it and then once they're finished that most people don't want to leave so they'll say well i i love this so much so then they go into my once a month ask the universe group and they carry on learning. And uh, so they get homework every, so every month they get a new question. So the universe gives me a question that they're to work out for the month for themselves. So it's not about what we were talking earlier. It's not just my way or the highway. It's like, how do you find your own way, your own connection? How does it come in for you? What works for you? What ritual works for you? I jog four miles every day. Hmm. That might not be yours. Yours could be something else that's going to give you that, you know, fresh breath every day. 
could be going into nature, you know, just or gardening or something, you know? For me, it's Richard Simmons. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> now I do walking. I walk about three miles a, a day. So, mm -hmm. yeah. It's I, good. I, and so. I use, I get a lot of messages from uh, that voice when I'm out running. And here was a one that, because uh, people are always so curious how I get that voice to talk to me, right? And uh, so one time I was out for a run and I just recently, and I said, why, why do you show up? so much like how do you show like, what did I say I asked why do you show up for some people more strongly than for others that's what I asked I think I put it that way and then I heard I show up most for those who follow their heart's longing hmm. and then of course am I following my heart's longing <laughs> <laughs> you know I appreciate you coming on I, I really do and um, I'd love to have you back and when I get your book and study it a little bit and I would love to join uh, your courses um, I'm very interested myself for me personally and you know one thing I, I love about learning how to find your rituals or spiritual 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 practices is like at, at first when you everything's new it's like learning how to drive a stick shift and then you're worrying about the clutch and when you're on a stop sign, you know, um, about, you know, on a, a red light, um, you know, the different gears and so on. So your, your brain, your brain's going a little bit, but it takes practice. Right. And when you start to apply it, it becomes second nature. And mm -hmm. that doesn't, and, and what I'm getting, trying to get to is when you learn how to suffer, you suffer much less. And when I learn how to go through situations, I'm still going to suffer. But when I learn how to apply these principles, it helps me get through them. And I find myself suffering much less. That doesn't mean I don't suffer. I still don't go through my stuff. Um, I don't suffer from uh, alcoholism anymore. But once in a while, I'll suffer from assholeism. <laughs> and, <laughs> but, uh, but I have tools to use to help get rid of that. And mm -hmm. that, that's the difference maker for me today. And, um, yeah, I'm truly grateful. And, um, yeah, I, I appreciate it. And I look forward to getting your book and, um, yeah, learning from it. I, I'm the type that studies stuff. I don't just, like, read it once. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like your book's a study. So it is a study, it. and I have a conversation guide. So people are using it as a book club book mm. so that they can, uh, you know, go through the, each guide. So they're doing like a chapter. Every And one group told me they took a whole year. They said, no, your book was the one. We just did one book, and it was yours. Wow, <laughs> so that they can awesome. practice all the exercises. They could do all the conversation guides. Because what it does is it helps you see like your, your, not just yourself, but how do you interact? Like, as I said, my daughter and I have come to terms. She's mind dominant and I'm spirit dominant. And now we can just joke about it. And it's not like, you know, we act, we recognize we're different and uh, <laughs> appreciate each other that way. Uh, but you can, but some people who were, you know, raised by maybe a real mind dominant parent or a real body dominant parent. Can you imagine having a body dominant dad who wants a spirit dominant boy to be in hockey? Hmm. You know, they might not want to be in hockey, but they might like to kayak where it's nice and quiet. Love that. Thank you. Maybe uh, um, get you in the future with the Q&A with your book. Get people mm. to buy your book and then do a Q&A. That would be awesome. That would be fun. Yeah. Well, thanks really for coming fun. on. I'm going to end it with the Neil Donald Walsh quote. Okay. And he says, we cannot have peace on earth until we learn to speak one voice. That voice must be the voice of reason, the voice of compassion, the voice of love. It is the voice of divinity within us. And what I appreciate about you is that it sounds like you're helping us to go back within. And that, that one voice is really, for me, it's understanding because understanding, learning, understanding people and their situations and their behaviors uh, brings us back to that one voice of love. So thank you. Appreciate that a lot. Appreciate you too. Um, talk to you soon and okay. namaste. Dizzle. <laughs> okay. Talk to you soon. There's no way out here. No, we all here working in a major way. Had to speak on it just to make a break. And they give
this looks like no we make a way. Time to level up on a day to day. No we out here working for the greater good. Expand your mind, broaden your lens the way you should. From the stars to the galaxy to speak on spirituality. I understand for the neighborhood.